Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and most weekdays the CosmoQuest team is here putting science in your brain. Today, however, is for rocket roundups. Let's get to it, shall we? First up, on September 7th at 0301 UTC, a Chinese Long March 4C launched the Gaofan 502 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit from the Tualien Satellite Launch Center in northeast China. Gaofan 502 is a replacement for the first Gaofan 5 satellite launched in 2018 under the China High Definition Earth Observation System, a constellation of Earth observing satellites. Let's watch the launch. The first Galfen 5 had six different instruments for measuring several different areas, atmospheric haze, air quality, climate change, and ozone measurement. These were the advanced hyperspectral imager, the visual and infrared multispectral sensor, the atmospheric infrared ultraspectral sensor, the greenhouse gas monitoring instrument, the environmental monitoring instrument, and the directional polarization camera. That's a lot of sensors, but very simply, they are measuring different indicators related to air pollution and climate change. For instance, there are sensors that measure ozone, atmospheric haze, and greenhouse gases, including methane, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon dioxide. One of the sensors called the Atmospheric Infrared Ultraspectral Sensor looks at the light from the sun as it passes through the atmosphere where the earth is occulting or blocking the sun. As the satellite orbits the earth, it can point at the AIUS at the sun and measure the light as it passes through different layers of the atmosphere. From this, it determines the temperature, pressure, and percentages of different gases, such as water vapor, ozone, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide at different altitudes. Galfen 502 marked the 30th Chinese launch of the year. Now, let's talk about the 31st Chinese launch in 2021. On September 9th at 11.01 UTC, a Chinese Long March 3B launched the ChinaSat 9B satellite into geostationary transfer orbit from the Xixian Satellite Launch Center in China. After separation, the satellite successfully deployed its solar panels and began communicating with the ground. Let's watch the launch. The manufacturer was fairly open with what the mission of ChinaSat 9B is, which is not something we often see with Chinese government satellites. It will provide radio and live television transmission. Compared to ChinaSat 9A, 9B has new transponders that will allow it to broadcast 4K and even 8K video, particularly for large sporting events such as the upcoming Winter Olympics, which will be held in Beijing in February 2022. Once on orbit and tested, the satellite will be transferred to China Satellite Communications, the state SATCOM operator. A few hours later, at 1959 UTC, a Soyuz 2.1V launched the RASBEG satellite into a 300-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit from the Plastek Cosmodrome in northern Russia. RASBEG is a small optical remote sensing satellite weighing 250 kilograms. It has a Reshi Kretian type telescope, which is a design that eliminates aberrations across a large field of view, which is used in almost all research telescopes today. The telescope has a sensor capable of providing sub-meter ground resolution from a 300-kilometer orbit. 
It replaces the Technology Demonstrator Experimental Small Space Apparatus, or EMPCA, which launched in 2018 and operated until earlier this year. Once RASBEG was in orbit, it was given the designation Cosmos 2551. The launch was delayed from late July 2021 for unknown reasons. Let's watch the launch. The launch vehicle for RASBEG, the Soyuz 2.1V, is a distant cousin of the usual Soyuz 2.1A or B we see used for most Soyuz launches. Unlike its cousins, the Soyuz 2.1V rocket lacks the four boosters of the regular Soyuz, which produces its distinctive Korolev cross. The usual first stage engine is replaced with a 50-year-old engine that was originally built for the unsuccessful N1 Soviet moon rocket. On the Soyuz 2.1V, that vintage engine is augmented with a vernier engine derived from the Soyuz second stage. The smaller vernier engine provides roll control on the first stage of the 2.1V, since the main engine can only control pitch. For comparison, the regular Soyuz first stage engine has four fixed nozzles and four vernier nozzles plumbed into the same turbo pumps to provide pitch, yaw, and roll control after the boosters separate. The two rockets have the same second stage. After a break, two different companies continue to fill out their internet satellite constellations. Stay tuned. On September 14th, at 0355 UTC, the Starlink Group 2-1 mission launched atop Falcon 9 Booster 1049 from Slick 4 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. This was the 10th flight for Booster 1049, which successfully landed on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, making it the first catch since being moved to the West Coast several months ago. B-1049 is only the second Falcon 9 first stage booster to make 10 flights. Let's watch the very foggy launch. Three, two, one, zero, lift off. Both of the fairings were reused, one making its second flight and the other its third. This was the 24th mission to use reused fairings and the 43rd and 44th reused fairings, according to the webcast. They were successfully fished out of the water by NRC Quest, the West Coast Fairing Retrieval Boat. All 51 satellites were successfully deployed into orbit several minutes after launch, following a single second stage burn. Because it's a Falcon 9 launch, there is video of a landing, too. Stage 1, entry burn shutdown. Both vehicles continue to follow nominal trajectories. Stage 1, FTS is saved. And of course, I Still Love You continues to have its loss of signal issues.
SpaceX launched these satellites from Vandenberg because it allowed them to put the satellites into a higher inclination orbit needed to provide coverage at higher latitudes. The trade-off for this is that more fuel is needed to achieve the higher inclination orbit, so the maximum payload is reduced, hence there being only 51 satellites rather than the usual complement of 60. As well, these satellites have been upgraded to include laser communication links, so they are slightly heavier than the previous model of Starlink satellites. For some reason, probably to mess up our tracking spreadsheet, SpaceX changed the naming scheme used for the first 28 Starlink launches to a different one for the launches in this new shell. These satellites are going into 70 degree inclination orbits at roughly the same altitude as the first 1,678 satellites, which went into 53 degree inclination orbits. There will be roughly the same number of satellites in this shell as the first one. While it is technically possible to launch into a 70 degree inclination orbit from Florida with the new southern dogleg trajectory, it is even easier to do this from Vandenberg, so SpaceX can launch satellites from the new, for the new shell from both coasts. Our last launch this week took place on September 14th at 1807 UTC. Ariane Space and its affiliate, StarSim, launched a Soyuz 2.1B frigate from the Balkanor Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Let's watch the launch. was conducted from pad 31-6. On board the Soyuz were 34 satellites for the OneWeb-10 mission, or flight ST-36 in Ariane space numbering. The rocket's frigate upper stage conducted several engine burns over the course of two and a half hours and then inserted the 36 satellites into the target orbit in several sets, bringing the number of satellites in the constellation to 322 satellites of a planned constellation of 648 OneWeb satellites, meaning it's over 49% complete. This launch marks the 1945th Soyuz launch since its debut 30 sorry since its debut 64 years ago. After the break, stay around to learn about a mission that set records which still stand today. Gemini 11 This week in rocket history, Gemini 11, a mission that set not one, but two records that still stand today. Highest altitude reached by a human in orbit and shortest time between launch and docking. The mission goals were to demonstrate fast docking required by the lunar module on its ascent from the moon and gain more experience performing spacewalks. Secondary goals were to demonstrate artificial gravity and perform some onboard experiments and astronomy. Gemini 11 launched on September 12, 1966 at 1442 UTC. Its docking target, Gemini Agena Target Vehicle 11, was launched 90 minutes earlier. Six minutes after launch, astronauts Richard Gordon and Peter Conrad were in orbit and quickly got ready to perform five rendezvous burns to meet up with the Agena. One hour and 25 minutes into the mission, they docked with the Agena. 
Once docked, each astronaut performed two docking demonstrations before riding the Agena into a slightly higher orbit. This concluded the first day of the mission. On the second day, September 13th, astronaut Gordon performed the mission's first spacewalk. He was supposed to attach a tether from the Agena onto the Gemini for a later artificial gravity demonstration and test out a new space power tool in the process. However, the exertion of moving the tether caused sweat to build up in his suit and he was blinded in one eye. He was ordered back into the spacecraft without attempting the power tool demonstration. This concluded the second day of the mission. The third day, September 14th of the mission, was the most important. The Agena fired its engine for 25 seconds, sending Gemini 11 into an orbit with a 1,374 kilometer apogee, setting the first record for the mission, as this is the highest altitude a crew mission has been in Earth orbit. After two revolutions in this extended orbit, the Agena fired again to lower Richard and Pete back into their prior orbit. Now it was time for another EVA, again by Gordon. This time he didn't leave the spacecraft, instead just standing up out of the hatch. He took photographs for two hours and then closed the hatch and repressurized the spacecraft. Then it was time for the artificial gravity demonstration. Gemini undocked and backed away to the length of the tether, which was 30 meters. Asteroid Conrad initiated a slow rotation of the coupled spacecraft with the Gemini's thrusters, keeping the tether taut. Initially, the two spacecraft wobbled around, but after 20 minutes, it was under control. This cycle of increasing rotation and oscillation followed by damping or smoothing out of the wobble was repeated several times until the combined spacecraft had a slight artificial gravity of 0.0015 of Earth's gravity measured on Gemini. The experiment was maintained for about three hours after which the Gemini undocked. It demonstrated for the first time in space the problems of simulating gravity. Nothing is held in place. So one or both of the things at the ends of the tether will wobble freely in a random direction. Also, the amount of artificial gravity they were able to produce was so small. Just 0.015% of that on Earth, that it wasn't useful. At 0822 UTC on September 15th, Gemini 11 docked the Agena for the final time. This final docking was completed manually after the rendezvous radar malfunctioned. After 44 orbits around the Earth, Gemini 11 performed its deorbit burn. The reentry was another first, the first completely computer controlled guided reentry of the US space program. Splashdown was at 1259 UTC on the 15th, bringing the mission to a close after just over 71 hours in space. All primary mission objectives were completed despite a few malfunctions, and the mission even got a bonus docking due to extra propellant. After the break, we'll be back with our weekly statistics and random space fact. Stay tuned. To wrap things up, here's a running tally of a few spaceflight statistics for the current year. Toilets currently in space, still eight. Four on the International Space Station, one on the Crew da Dragon, one on the Soyuz, one on the Shenzhou, and one on the Tianhe. Total 2021 orbital launch attempts, 88, including seven failures. Total satellites from launches, 1,370. We keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. China, 33. USA, 31. Kazakhstan, 7. Russia, 7. New Zealand, 4. French Guiana, 3. India, 2. Iran, 1. 
your random space fact, is in September 1962, a piece of the re-entering Korbel Sputnik 1, the first uncrewed Vostok spacecraft, landed in a street in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Now, every year in early September, the city hosts Sputnik Fest, commemorating the event. This year, it was held on Saturday, September 11th. This has been your Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX.